Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, um, in April, there was to have been a four-part lecture series on the latest research in various aspects of vision science, uh, and it was canceled for obvious reasons. Fortunately for us, two of the speakers have consented to give us virtual presentations. The second is expected to take place in uh, the first week in December, and today we have the first of those talks. So I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Martin Banks, uh, a professor of optometry and vision science and an affiliate professor of psychology and bioengineering. Professor Banks received his BA in psychology at Occid Occidental College, an MA in experimental psychology at UC San Diego, and a PhD in developmental psychology at the University of Minnesota. After a period as a postdoc and assistant professor at UT Austin, he came to Berkeley in 1984. His research career has centered around visual space perception and sensory combination. He describes three aspects of this as follows. First, the use of motion and stereoscopic information to determine the spatial layout of the visible environment and one's motion through the environment. Second, the combination of information from more than one sense modality, that is, e.g. Um, vision and touch. And third, the construction and evaluation of devices for creating useful virtual environments um, uh, vision, uh, vestibular, and touch. In all cases, his research group, the Visual Perception Laboratory, seeks to determine how efficiently human observers utilize the available stimulus information while performing perceptual tasks and to apply the results to emerging technologies such as virtual reality. So uh, without further ado, I'm pleased to turn it over to Martin Banks. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the invite. I'm glad we finally had the chance to get together. Um, I'm sitting at home in North Berkeley, but I will, um, I believe I can share the, my screen. Let's see. Uh, you might need to release that for me, Chris. I don't see that I have access to. Okay, working on it. Okay. Okay, it should, it should be allowing you to do so now. Hmm. Ah. Um, okay. Normally when I click on, oh, here we go. That's somebody else's screen. Okay, so it took my screen and not yours. Let's try again. When you go to share screen, it worked. It did. Okay, why don't you try again? And if we can't, then... Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that worked. Um, I'm going to try advanced. So what it shows is that one participant can share at a time or multiple participants can share simultaneously. And I'm. it looks like I'm... So I clicked on one participant. That didn't do anything. I'm clicking on advanced sharing only host. Um, okay, I will, I'm going to make you host. Okay. And let's see if that gives you more power. Thanks everyone for being patient. We did a test run and it did work, but it, it did. A little technical glitch. Oh, here we go. I got it. Great. Okay, I hope that uh, everyone should see a should see a slide that says perceptual bases for rules of thumb in photography. Good. Yes. It's coming That's through to me. I think we're doing great. Yes. Okay. Um, so this area of research is is not my main area area of interest, but I've been fascinated uh, by some things they say in photography textbooks that seem to not have any real science behind them. So I, I just kind of put these various topics in my back pocket over the years and, and collected them into this um, lecture. And uh, to me, the kind of interesting point is that these rules of thumb that appear in photography textbooks and are known by a lot of professional photographers, uh, they, they don't know why. And um, so the analysis of it that we've done, in the end, it, it requires uh, knowing something about the physics of the situation, how the image gets formed, and something about uh, the, the way the visual system works, 
And finally, about people's viewing habits. And so just kind of keep that in mind as we go along, because it's fun that, um, that uh, photographers know these things, but they don't know why. And uh, physicists and vision scientists can help us uh, understand these rules of thumb. Uh, this is a picture in a book by a famous vision scientist named Perrin, who had an interest, interest in optics and photography. And it's a picture of a sphere on top of a column. That sphere is a sphere, and the, there's nothing wrong with the photograph. It's not distorted. But uh, it looks like an ovoid to you, I'm quite sure. And we're going to talk about why that is. Here are other, two other images. Uh, the one on the left uh, looks like kind of a stretched in depth version of a person. And the one on the right is the opposite. That's a compressed in depth um, photograph. And in both cases, the photographer intended to create those effects. And uh, we're going to discuss uh, why, they, why they work. And here's a fun one. This is um, a, a famous street artist named Julian Beaver, who does most of his work in Scotland. Uh, there he is on the, on the right. And this is a sidewalk drawing he's made. And uh, the next picture, the next slide is going to show the, what it looks like when taken, when viewed from this vantage point right here. And there it is. That, that unbelievably is the same, the same object. Uh, here again is the, the actual painting on the sidewalk. And here's the view from that special place. And he's really clever. I mean, notice what he's done with his foot. It looks like he's put his foot down into the pool. What he's actually done is just move his foot forward toward the camera, but it creates the illusion of uh, the, the pool actually having depth to it. And we're going to discuss um, uh, these things as well. And finally, if I have time, I'm just going to discuss some interesting effects in uh, depth of field. We may not have time to get to that, but um, we'll see. OK, so these are the topics. The first is wide angle distortion. Uh, the second is depth compression and expansion. And the third is the effect of uh, depth of field blur in photographs. So the wide angle distortion is well known in photography, cinematography, computer graphics, perspective painting. Uh, interestingly, the, the photography textbooks for the normal uh, 35 millimeter film format say that you need a lens focal length of about 50 millimeters to avoid this effect. And we're going to come back to where did that 50 millimeters come from. Uh, depth compression and expansion, again, it's well known, talked about in the textbooks. And um, kind of as a coincidence, the texts recommend, again, a focal length of about 50 millimeters to make the image look neither compressed nor expanded. And uh, the depth field blur, widely used in photography, cinematography, to create artistic effects, to attract the gaze of the viewer. And as it turns out, to create a sense of largeness or smallness in a scene. And I hope we can get to that. OK, the wide angle distortion. Here's another photograph of spheres on top of columns. Those are real spheres. They're not ovoids. And uh, there's nothing geometrically incorrect about this photograph. Turns out we're just viewing it from the wrong distance. And our brains don't know how to take that into account. So we're seeing distorted images of correct photographs of spheres. Now, I, when I first saw this image, I made a big version of it, calculated what distance one should look at it from, and looked at it with one eye from that distance. And uh, by golly, they look like spheres. And then you look at it with two eyes, they look less like spheres. And then you stand far back, and they look totally like ovoids. And um, this effect is known in photography. There are software manipulations that are meant to uh, minimize this wide angle distortion. Here we have um, uh, an original photograph on the top, and then the, uh, an anamorphic correction given to it that is meant to minimize the perceived wide angle distortion. And you can see that it works. Those people look like 
probably more like what they actually look like uh, than this fellow over here looks elongated this way and this lady over here looks elongated this way. They look more normal in the corrected, geometrically incorrect photograph. So uh, as I said, this effect is well known in the textbooks. Uh, 50 millimeter uh, focal length is recommended. Uh, if you want a rule of thumb for other formats like um, digital cameras, you want your focal length to be 40 to 50% wider than the sensor width, and then you can avoid the effect. But what determines that 50 millimeter rule? And here's a quote from a textbook. It says, by following the rule, it creates, quote, a field of view that corresponds to that of normal vision, or, quote, the same perspective as the human eye. To a vision scientist, those two statements are absolute nonsense. Uh, the first is the field of view turns out to be about, um, if I remember correctly, about 45 degrees wide uh, with following this rule. The field of view of human vision is about 200 degrees wide. So it doesn't correspond at all to that of normal vision. Uh, it creates the same perspective as the human eye. Uh, I'm not even sure what that means. I, I, I can't interpret that statement. So I, I just think these, these explanations are uh, empty. So to understand this effect, we've got to go a little bit through the geometry of perspective projection. And here's a demonstration of that. We have a scene, whoops, whoop, 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 sorry. Hmm. We have a scene uh, composed of a cube and two spheres. Let's imagine they're real objects. And in perspective projection, we're gonna image that scene on a plane called the projection plane. And the way that's done is you want to imagine the rays of light emanating from each point in the original scene. So imagine this corner of the cube has blue rays of light emanating in all directions. And we capture the ray that goes through a point called the center of projection. So there's only one such ray from that corner. And uh, this corner, we of all the rays that come from that corner, the one we capture is the one that goes through this center of projection. You can think of that as the aperture in a camera, um, but in, in, in graphics, it's a pinhole, um, et cetera. And then what we do is we, those rays that go through the center of projection, we intercept them with a plane. That could be film in the case of a camera. It could be a palette of an artist in the case of perspective painting. And um, I think you can see in this construction that if we viewed the scene or the picture of that scene from this point, they would create the same image in our eye. And that's the beauty of perspective projection. It's a way to create the correct geometry of a 3D scene in the retinal image of the viewer. Um, just a little bit of math. If in the projection, I want to trace through what happens to a sphere. So a sphere has a height B and a width A. Of course, A is equal to B because it's a sphere. The rays projected into the projection plane intersect that plane at an oblique angle. And as a consequence, that changes the shape of um, A upon B compared to big A upon B. And that's uh, shown in this projection equation where little a equals big A, some projection parameters that are constants, uh, divided by the cosine of this angle, what we call the slant angle. That's the important term. And you know, the cosine is one or a smaller. And um, so that's always gonna shrink that's, sorry, it's always going to stretch A relative to B or have no effect. So uh, this correct projection of the sphere ends up being an ellipse elongated in direction A relative to B. Then we go to an eye, a human eye or a camera placed at the center of projection. 
And that goes through another perspective projection, in this case, onto the retina or onto the film. And if you track through the math on that, this cosine term ends up in the numerator, not the denominator. And so as a consequence, the, the stretching effect in the plane and the shrinking effect in the projection on the retina cancel. So in the end, a little a in the retina, that should say alpha, sorry. Alpha is uh, proportional to big A and beta is proportional to big B. So alpha upon beta is equal to one as it should be. So that's the beauty of perspective projection. We can create the same retinal image as the real world would create, and we can do it on a photograph. But we got to play by the rules. We have to view the photograph from the, we have to do the projections correctly, and we have to view the photograph from the right position, the center of projection. And uh, this slide, slides will drive that point home. Here we have our original scene and the picture of the scene, and we're gonna view it from position C, the center of projection. And so here's what, what it would look like, whether you're looking at the scene or the picture, they look the same. But what if we move to the wrong position to O prime? Well, then the scene's gonna look different because we move to the right. We're gonna see more of the right side of the cube, for example. And the picture is gonna look different too, but no longer the same as the scene. We broke the rules. So we didn't follow the rules of perspective projection and that caused a geometric distortion of what the geometry should be. Okay, so, um, you know, if the brain really cared about that, every time you looked at a picture, PowerPoint, realistic painting, there'd be one and only point to view it from and any other point you'd see a distorted, incorrect version of the scene. And I think you all know that that's not the case. Uh, people happily go to movie theaters and sit way from the wrong, way, in an, uh, way far away from the correct position. They go to art museums and stand to the side and look at realistic uh, Renaissance paintings and it doesn't bother them. So that's our first puzzle is, are people able to compensate for their incorrect viewing position? And if they are, how do they do it? So we did a study. This is the kind of study we do in vision science. We created a scene littered with perspective cues. There's cubes, there's square tiles, and the scene always had a central red object and the judgment that the subjects were asked to make is its shape. They were asked, is it wider than it is tall or taller than it is wide? Simple task. And um, the trick is that we would vary its shape. Here it's too tall, here it's pretty much a sphere, and here it's way too wide. So subjects adjusted the shape until it looked spherical. Uh, but we played a trick on them, and that is we rotated the display. So sometimes they had to look at it at an oblique angle. We rotated the display through this angle, S sub M. We were very careful to get the projections on the screen correct, so we knew what they were. Now let's think about what people might do. We asked them, set it till it looks like a sphere. So the first worry was, well, maybe people won't know what that means. Maybe they'll say, do you want it to look like a sphere on the screen? Do you want me to make it look like a sphere in my retina? Do you want me to imagine it's in a 3D world I'm not seeing and say, well, there's a sphere in that world? So we're worried they wouldn't know how to do the task. Totally not worth worrying. People sit down and they happily do the task and they never even ask what coordinate system do you have to be in. So that was good. And people do this task very reliably, very systematically. Well, let's think about what they might do. They might set the shape on the screen 
so that it made a spherical image, a circular image on the retina, or they might set it, so that would be operating in, in uh, retinal coordinates. You would create a distorted image on the screen so that it looked circular on the retina. Or they might operate in screen coordinates, so they'd set it on the screen to be a circle, even though that made it non-circular on the retina, right? So in one case, they're responding to the shape on the retinal image only. And the other case, they're responding to the shape on the screen and somehow undoing the effect of um, the shape of the retinal image. So uh, here's the way we're going to plot the data. This is the viewing angle, uh, viewing it straight or viewing it off to the left or off to the right. And uh, this is the aspect ratio of the object they presented. Uh, in screen coordinates. So one means that they set it to a circle on the screen. If they set it to a circle in the retina, that cosine term reappears and they'd set it to this shape on the screen. So this curvilinear shape would be diagnostic of setting it to a constant shape on your retina. The straight line would be diagnostic of setting it to a constant shape on the screen. Let's see what people did. So the first experiment, we had people look through a pinhole with one eye. They were on a bite bar, so they couldn't move their head. <laughs> and we had them set it to the shape that they thought looked like a sphere. And you can see they set it to a circle on their retina, very reliably. And they also reported that they had no idea where the object was. They couldn't tell if it was 10 feet away or one feet, foot away. It's just this floating red object in space. Uh, I should say they couldn't see the edge of the display screen. Okay, so with a pinhole and looking with one eye, they set it to a constant shape on the retina. Let's now take the pinhole away and open up the second eye. So they're looking with two eyes now. Exact same task, otherwise identical. And boom, that changes things dramatically. So for example, this point right here, there's a shape. They saw that as a circle with one eye through a pinhole. And then when we let them look with the second eye, they changed the shape on the screen dramatically and said, now that looks like a sphere. This is so dramatic that we had a demo in the lab where people would come in and We'd have them set it with um, through a pinhole with one eye. And then we let them take the pinhole away and open the other eye, and they could see the shape change. <laughs> uh, it changed slowly enough as the brain kind of recompensated that they would see the effect as if it was changing on the screen. It wasn't. Um, that, that was their perceptual mechanism. So we're going to call that invariance. That means you're seeing the same shape, uh, even though you're viewing it from different angles. So the shape on the retina is different. So these people are seeing the shape on the screen, not dictated strictly by the shape on the retina. So we're going to call that um, a, the ability to compensate for an oblique view. And um, there were people had known about this effect um, way back into the 19th century that kind of knew that you could compensate for these off-axis viewing positions. And there are two theories. One was uh, called pictorial compensation. Very complicated. I'm not going to go into it because it's wrong anyway. And then another very simple idea uh, from the American psychologist Hans Wallach, uh, who said that all people are doing is they're seeing the surface slant of the screen and they're taking that into account. They're undoing that effect. Simple as that. Doesn't matter what the picture is, people are doing that. For those of you who know a bit about vision science, that's called shape constancy. And uh, Wallach made that a well-known phenomenon. And um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to make a long story short and tell you that, that that's exactly what people are doing. They're, the, this last slide here, the blue data points uh, show that people are just calculating the slant of the display screen putting that into the calculator inside the head and undoing that uh, slanted view. 
And that's what causes this. And so it's a good thing. It means when you sit in the wrong seat in the theater, your brain can estimate the slant of the cinema screen, take it into account, so you see roughly the right shape of objects on the screen. Not, not identical, but, but roughly correctly. And I, I would argue that's why pictures work. If we really had to be at the right position to view everything, uh, pictures would be very demanding. We'd, need, we'd need, need to each have our own picture so we could view it from the right place. We couldn't share screens, et cetera, et cetera. Now this wide field distortion effect turns out to be a byproduct of this process. What's happening is when a person looks to the object, if they stand centered in front of the picture and look up to the upper left, their brains take into account that the surface of the display is slanted at that point and it undoes the slanted view. Well, remember, this is a correct projection. This is right. It should be elliptical on the screen due to those perspective equations I showed you earlier. So the brain's doing what it doesn't need to do in that case, and that is take the slant of this uh, wide angle picture into account up in the corners. So that's what causes it. You can eliminate the effect by looking through a pinhole, so you can't really tell what the orientation of the surface is in that point. Then the effect goes away. Um, remember, the photographers recommend that you use a focal length of 50 millimeters to eliminate this effect, which just seems obscure. Why, why would that be? Well, let's think about that a bit. Um, here's the, an equation that describes the the image formation in a camera. Uh, w is the width of your film or sensor plane. Uh, F is the focal length of the camera. And theta is the angle, the field of view of that picture. So uh, in the upper part here is the angle that the camera can see. So here with a 28 millimeter lens, you can see 75 degree, theta is 75 degrees, whereas with a 1,000 millimeter lens, uh, theta is about two and a half degrees, much smaller. So long focal lengths capture a smaller angle. Short focal lengths capture a larger angle. And um, so what we did is we looked at the uh, human ability to determine whether an object is a circle or an ellipse. And it turns out uh, you need about a 5% increase in width over height before people say that's not a circle, that's an ellipse. So keep that 5% number in mind. Whoops, whoops, whoops. My mouse is being overly sensitive. And, um, uh, 5% occurs at just short of 20 degrees from the center of a photograph. So if we work back through, back through the math and plug 20 degrees in and solve for F, it comes out to be 48 millimeters, pretty close to the recommenda recommendation of 50 millimeters by the photography text. So our argument is that the, the recommendation by the photography text is sensible, it's the right thing to do, but the understanding of it is, um, is not there. Uh, and we think we have understood it as a consequence of the brain taking into account the slant of a photograph at the oblique parts of the photograph and, and in effect creating this distortion perceptually. <coughs> Okay, I'm at a transition point. If there are um, questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat at the moment. Okay. So I guess you should go on. Okay. Uh, this next one's um, fun because it involves um, social psychology. Uh, this is depth compression and expansion. Um, 
I, I showed you those effects earlier. Remember that um, we can make an image look expanded in depth or compressed in depth. And it turns out the way you do that is by the choice of the focal length of the camera. You get this expansion effect with a short focal length, and you get the compression effect with the choice of a long focal length. These are images from a well-known photography textbook by London and colleagues. <coughs> Here's a nice set of photographs from that textbook. Uh, the scene is the same in all three cases. They adjusted the pictures so that the woman was roughly the same size in the three pictures. The middle one, uh, according to the textbook, looks like what the original scene looked like. The upper one looks expanded in depth. She looks too close and he looks too far relative to where they really were. And the lower one looks compressed in depth. They look too close to each other in depth compared to where they really were. So that leads again to this um, 50 millimeter focal length recommendation. And uh, London says in the text, this occurs because the angle of view seems natural and the relative size of near and far objects seems normal. Well, that's true, but that's just a description of the phenomenon. That's not, a, not an explanation. So we sought to see if we could uh, find an explanation. Uh, and the first thing I want to show is that this is not due to, the, these effects are not due to some distortion created by the camera lens and the, and the film. And we're going to do that by showing computer graphic images where we know everything is correct. So here's a scene uh, that we created. And we're going to change the focal length of the camera viewing that scene while keeping the image of the bottle roughly constant size. And I just want you to see how the scene changes as I play the video. Here it looks kind of expanded in depth. As I change the focal length, it looks like that table is getting closer to the wall and that the outdoor scene is getting closer to the house. And then I think it plays back. Yeah. And then we go back. So there's our depth compression and depth expansion effects. Everything is geometrically correct. We're just changing the focal length of the lens. And um, I know a portrait photographer in Berkeley who, who's, or actually in Oakland, who's very good. And um, I talked to her about the following and she said, oh yeah, we know this. <laughs> we interview people before we take their portrait and we ask them to tell us about themselves. And if someone says, um, I'm a very friendly person, I'm very approachable, uh, people like me a lot. She says we tend to pick a shorter focal length. If someone says, I'm a persuasive, uh, bright, sometimes kind of aggressive person, uh, they pick a longer focal length. I said, why? <laughs> and she said, uh, because the customer is more satisfied with that. Okay. So we're going to look into this too. Why, why? So this is, by the way, is the same woman in roughly the same pose shot with a 24 millimeter lens and a 300 millimeter lens. And the image was adjusted, I think, to keep her nose roughly the same size. Maybe the eye separation the same. And uh, they look like very different people. Um, and again, to show that this is not a, a geometric distortion, we did this in computer graphics where we know everything's correct. Whoop. And let's play that video. Short focal length, medium, long, back to medium, and short. So you can see the same effects you saw in this picture are occurring in this computer graphic image as well. Um, Pietro Perona, computer scientist at Caltech, uh, was interested in these effects and did, the, did a study that has, uh, I think, remarkable findings. He took pictures of people 
with a short focal length, medium focal length, and long focal length lens. In each panel, uh, the short lens is on the left, medium is in the middle, and long focal length is on the right. And he had uh, some large number of people that he took pictures of. Uh, they were women, they were men, they were young, they were old, they're different ethnic groups, everything you could think of. And then he asked uh, subjects to rate these people. So he random, randomized the stack of photographs and just brought up one at a time and asked people to rate these, the people in the photographs in terms of good versus evil, uh, friendly versus hostile, uh, extroverted versus introverted, weak versus strong, dumb versus smart. And you can see that people made pretty consistent and reliable judgments of the same people taken with different focal lengths. For example, um, look at this approachable versus distant one. Approachable, people were judged to be much more approachable with a short focal length picture than with a long focal length. And again, they're the same people. Uh, weak versus strong. Uh, short focal length, people look weaker. Uh, long focal length, they look stronger. Um, good versus evil. So people are making these attributions that have nothing to do with the person the photograph is taken of. The attributions are based on the, the photograph. So let's um, look into this. What causes this? We'll come back to why I think people make these judgments. I'm just going to try to explain them why the faces are perceived differently and objects are perceived differently uh, based on focal length. Okay, so again, the relationship between focal length and field of view. Uh, short focal length is a big field of view. Long focal length is a small field of view. And here's example pictures of the same scene, short focal length, medium, and long. So there's our depth expansion and depth compression effects. And here's the geometry of the situation. We have some scene here, a red object and a blue object. And we're going to image that scene onto a film with a lens focal length of f. And uh, so we project the rays from the scene through the center projection onto our film. We record the images on the film. And then we calculate the field of view from that same equation I showed you earlier. The focal length is here, the width of the film or sensor is here, and this is the field of view that would correspond to that. And then of course we take the picture and we print it or show it on a computer screen. And uh, in so doing, very frequently we magnify the picture. So that's uh, the magnification factor is M. If we double its size, uh, M is equal to two. And uh, so then there's our print. And then we're going to have a person view the photograph. And uh, they'll see some angle in the print uh, shown by this arc. And um, you can show that the height of the photograph once magnified into the print is equal to MWC, where W was the WC was the size of the film and M is the magnification. So what we really want to do is view the photograph so that the angle, the field of view we create when we view it is theta sub V. And, um, and here's the math associated with that. And the key is we want to view it from the distance of the center of projection. That's the key. So if we put ourselves at the right distance, we're going to recreate the correct geometry of that original scene when we view the photograph. Very simple rule. The distance that you should view it from is equal to the focal length of the original pic camera picture times the magnification of the print. Really simple. What if we view it from the wrong distance? So here we're viewing it from too far away. Well, let's think about that. Let's say we took a picture 
of kind of like an open book. And it was open to a right angle, to a 90 degree angle. So it's like an open book hinge. And we're going to view a photograph of that open book hinge. Well, the two sides of the, of the book, if we project them out, create what we call vanishing points. So this line and this line, somewhere off the distance will intersect at a vanishing point. And this line and this line, somewhere off to the right, will intersect at another vanishing point. And here they are, the vanishing points for the one side and the other side. And um, if we follow the rules, we view it from the right distance, the vanishing points should subtend an angle of 90 degrees, a right angle for us, if we viewed it correctly. If we view it from too far away, well, that doesn't move where the paint is on the photograph, but it does change the angles falling into the eye. So if we're too far away, now the vanishing point subtends less than 90 degrees, and the inferred shape of the hinge has to become this, elongated in depth. So that's what happens when you view it from too far away. If you view it from too close, the opposite happens. So here's our hypothesis. We think this effect is caused by people viewing from the wrong distance. Simple. If they view long focal length pictures from too close, they should look compressed. And if they view short focal length pictures from too far, they should look expanded. And we're going to argue that normal focal length, the recommendation of the photography textbooks, corresponds to the length for which people actually view it from the correct distance. Let's see if that's true. So what we did is we created a bunch of pictures with all kinds of different focal lengths and croppings and magnifications, everything we can think of. Some were computer-generated computer images, some were photographs, uh, some were indoor scenes, some were outdoor scenes, some were pictures of people, just everything we could think of. We made hundreds of photographs. Here's some examples. Here's some um, indoor scene with a, a, a woman in it, uh, taken with two different focal lengths. Here's a computer generated scene of a bedroom, again, taken with two different focal lengths. Same scene in both cases, but they look different because of the focal length choice. Uh, we presented different magnifications. This is the same picture, just magnified more on the right. We did different croppings. These have the same magnification, but we cropped the you know, image differently in these cases. Basically everything we could think of. And then we did the most obvious thing we had. We would put up a photograph on the wall one at a time and told the subjects, adjust your distance until you feel like you're seeing this from the correct distance. And some of the subjects did look at us like, what? <laughs> what are you asking me to do? Just do it. And uh, sure enough, people happily do this. They would walk toward the photo and away from the photo and say, yeah, that seems right to me. And uh, we were surprised at how consistent people were in these judgments, even though they felt like they didn't know what they're doing. And here's what happened. So the vertical axis is going to be the, the average distance that they chose, chose to view a photograph from. The horizontal axis is going to be the focal length of the original picture. And different colors are going to be different magnifications of the print. If people did the right thing and viewed these photographs from the correct position, the data would look like this, with a high magnification, a steep diagonal line, with a lower magnification, a shallower diagonal line, but a clear effect of focal length. Increasing focal length, you should stand farther away. Decreasing focal length, you should stand closer. So that would be um, what, what you'd hope people would do. On the other hand, if they just 
moved in and out until they, the pictures subtended a, an, a, a constant angle at their eye. Then those data would be flat lines, uh, different distances depending on how much we magnify, closer for small prints, farther for big prints. But there'd be no effect of focal length. That's the important thing. And that's what people did. Here are the data. Uh, they did not take focal length into account. So no matter what the focal length was, they basically set their distance according to the size of the print. That's not exactly true. There was a small deviation from that. Uh, people don't like to get too close or too far. So the slope of the line is a little bit less than the pure geometry would dictate. But that, that's basically what people do. They set their distance based on the size of the print, not based on the contents. And so that's our theory that when you view a photograph like this, you should view it from a long distance to get the right geometry in your retina. And people don't do that. They view it from too close. And when you view an image like this, um, with a long focal length, you should, uh, I'm sorry, I had that backwards. This is short focal length, so people should view it from a near distance, and they don't. They view it from too far. And the one on the right, they should view it from a long distance, and they don't. They view it from too close. And um, those compression and expansion effects are a perceptual consequence of uh, standing at the wrong distance. Uh, this has implications for um, focal lengths you want. If you're using a cell phone to view things, if you're using a print, a computer, TV, et cetera. But I want you to notice um, this line is what the 50 millimeter rule would dictate. And a lot of the data fall close to that line. So people are actually setting their distance roughly correctly uh, following the 50 millimeter rule. Uh, not true with smaller devices, and they, they deviate from that. So we think that's where the 50 millimeter rule comes from. And um, uh, we came across this publication a couple years ago. Someone sent it to us. It was in the uh, Journal of American Medical Association, Facial Plastic Surgery Journal. And uh, plastic surgeons have noticed that there's an increase in the number of people wanting nose jobs. And uh, a pretty dramatic increase, apparently. And uh, when they asked their patient, well, why do you want a nose job? Well, my nose is too big. I want it to be smaller. Well, why do you think it's too big? And they would show uh, selfies they had taken from their cell phone. Well, that's exactly the, <laughs> the plays into this effect we're talking about. Uh, a selfie is taken with a short focal length, and then you view it from too far. So it makes the nose look elongated for the reasons I was saying. So we wrote a reply to this and just uh, noted that that is probably the consequence of it. And uh, so if you really didn't want to have recommend surgery for a, a nose because it really wasn't too long, uh, take their photograph with a different device and have them view it from the right distance so they can see what they really look like. Okay, so time-wise, I, I think I should probably stop there. I'm gonna blast through the next bit, um, just show you some images that we're gonna, we're, we were gonna talk about depth of field blur. And I just wanna show you this, because it's fun. Uh, if you look at that, you can see that it's a wire cube with a pencil running through it. And uh, how about this one? A lot of people find that harder to interpret, but eventually I think you can get it. You have to realize that that vertex is near and this vertex is far. All we did is change the focus of the camera, nothing else changed. So here's the original with the camera focused near and here it is with the camera focused far. And it's amazing what a, uh, how that changed the interpretation of the object. And here's another fun thing. This is a scene of uh, downtown San Francisco. 
shot with a kind of conventional camera. And I'm going to show you next the same scene shot with a camera that has, it's a virtual camera that has a 60 meter aperture. And uh, so that creates a lot of blur uh, in distances that virtual camera is not focused. And to a lot of people, it makes the scene look small, it makes it look like a toy world. So there's the original. You could believe that's downtown San Francisco. And to a lot of people, this looks like a toy model of San Francisco. Here's an image a friend sent um, of a scene in some town in Germany where the, he applied the same trick and it makes the scene look like a toy. And uh, here the opposite is used in cinematography where they get rid of blur to make things look bigger. So the next part of the talk is going to be about is um, why that happens. I unfortunately won't have time to talk about that, but I'd be happy to answer questions about it. So let me thank um, one of the great things, as you know, about hanging out at Berkeley is you get to meet some wonderfully talented people. And the people who work in these projects were uh, Don Raj Vishwanath, who's now a professor at St. Andrews University, Anna Gershik, who works for Ancestry.com, uh, Robert Held, who uh, now works at Microsoft. Uh, Emily Cooper came back to be a, a new professor in Berkeley Optometry. Uh, James O'Brien is a professor in Berkeley Computer Science. And Elise Piazza, I have to update this, um, is now a professor at McGill University. And we received our funding from NIH and NSF and from the Center for Innovation and Vision and Optics, which is a new center formed in the School of Optometry. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Um, okay, so I have a question here for you. Um, mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's basically only one question so far, so folks, if you have other questions, please start typing. <laughs> um, so, so this was in the first part of the first section of your talk, this came. Uh, can you explain why the rule of thumb for portrait photography is that the recommended lens would be a 60 millimeter lens? Um, portrait photography. Yeah. Um, the effect that we're focused in on here is uh, demonstrated in this picture <clears throat> where the focal length on the left is uh, shorter than the recommendation and the focal length on the right is longer than the recommendation. And I'm told by portrait photographers if you shoot a series of pictures of different focal lengths and then make prints and ask people which print looks most like the person, they will pick around 50 or 60 millimeters. That's a, for 35 millimeter format. And um, the reason we believe that, that the other images look not natural is the short focal length looks expanded in depth. So this woman's nose here looks elongated toward the camera. Her face looks more cylindrical than it really is, uh, more curved in this dimension than it really is. Whereas this, I, I don't know the person in the photograph, but oh shoot, now I lost it. There. Um, but this apparently does not look like the woman. It looks uh, flattened compared to the original woman. Her forehead looks flat, her face looks wide and flat. So it just doesn't really look like her. And um, I, I honestly think that's just a function of how we view these photographs. If I could make you view these two photographs from the correct distance, they would look more like the, the person actually looks. But people just don't do that. They don't view it from the correct distance. OK, good. Now I have more questions. So let's see. Uh, how, does, uh, this, how do these um, things work on a curved TV screen? What difference does that make? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, um, uh, how can I answer that question fairly shortly? If the screen was a sphere and the viewer was at the center of the sphere and the TV producers knew how to project the images correctly, that would be great. That would get rid of all these effects. It would be wonderful. The curved TVs are not a sphere, they're a cylinder. 
people don't sit at the center of the cylinder and the TV manufacturers do not do the correct projections onto the screen. So I, I think it's kind of a mess. Uh, so there is an opportunity there. I advise the TV manufacturers and they just say it's too expensive to do the right thing. And they certainly don't want to have a TV set designed for one viewer at a time. They want you know families to participate. So I just think in general, it's not a very good idea. Thank I you. didn't buy one. <laughs> Um, all right, another question. What are the implications for facial recognition te technology? It seems that the appearance of faces varies considerably depending on the angle of view, focal lengths of the camera used, etc. That's another great question. And um, who, who's your second speaker in vision science? Is it Hani? Uh, Emily Fareed? Cooper is coming. Emily Cooper, Cooper is coming. Oh, Emily Cooper. Cooper is. Her husband, Hani Fareed, uh, would totally know the answer to that question. Um, if the questioner would send me an email, right. I'll find out. I, I, th I think it is a problem. I think it is going to mess things up because a lot of those uh, recognition things are based in geometry. Uh, but Fareed would actually know um, what the effect is. So uh, my email is martybanks at berkeley.edu. And uh, so send me the question, then I can get the answer from uh, Hani. I'm actually seeing Hani tomorrow, so I, it, it'll be easy for me to find out. Well, let me follow up on that myself. So, uh, but don't, don't they, haven't the people programming the phone, for instance, that's going to recognize your face already taken into account the, the number of different angles they're going to see you from? So they, they put in more information to check out? Uh, they, they, they do. Uh, I mean, it's based on, you know, large databases with lots of photographs of the person. And um, so the question would be the, the interesting part of that would be, uh, if you vary the focal length more than is normally done, more, more than is in their data set, mm -hmm. would that throw off the algorithm? Right, okay. And I think it might. Um, oh, let's see. So this one was uh, another thing about cell phone cameras, actually. Uh, to your knowledge, do cell phone cameras ever include digital correction or compensation for these short focal length distortions? Uh, you can, I, I don't think they're built in. I'm not sure on that. I don't think they're built in, but you can buy apps that, uh, that do that. So that one I showed earlier, um, there's an app uh, very much like that. It's called an anamorphic correction. Right. Um, all right, here we have a question about the rule of the thirds in photo composition. Um, it is, can you describe why this is recommended in terms of uh, vision? No, I don't really have a good explanation for that. Um, I think we humans uh, have a more aesthetic experience with things that aren't absolutely symmetric and a more aesthetic experience with things that aren't too far from symmetric. There's kind of a sweet zone in between. My wife and I are designing a house and we're arguing over the, exactly that dimension of symmetry. <laughs> I want more asymmetric, she wants less asymmetric. But I, I, I think that rule somehow appeals to our aesthetic sense, and I, I don't find a ready explanation for that in, in uh, vision science. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. Um, all right, so let's see. Someone asked whether the recorded version would be available, and yes, this is being recorded, so it should be available uh, later on. Um, someone would like to see the graph that shows the distance and people's perception of being honest, evil, dumb. Um, do you have examples of those pictures? Oh, I don't. Um, I don't. But uh, you'd have to kind of infer that from, from right. these. You know, if I said, one, if you did, didn't believe they're the same person, I said, which person is smarter? I think most people would say the person on the right. Uh, which person uh, has a history of some mental illness? Uh, I think you'd probably say the person on the left. Uh, which person has a tendency to be a, kind of aggressive and a little uh, difficult to approach? I would say the one on the right. And uh, let's think about where those come from. Um, I did a search through the literature and I found all the studies that I found were on men, not, not on women. So that's, that's one um, caveat. But it turns out if you measure the, eye, the 
cheekbone to cheekbone width, we'll call that cheek width, and the middle of the lip to the middle of the eye height, we'll call that lip eye height, and express that as a ratio. So it'll be the cheek over eye. If that ratio is high, that means you have a wide face and kind of scrunch this way. If the ratio is low, it means the opposite. Well, it turns out that ratio on men is predictive of their criminal history record, the likelihood they've been in prison. There's a study on hockey players that predicts the number of penalty minutes they have. Um, and some other things that, that I've forgotten. And so the, the, the shape of a man's face really is predictive of um, an aggressive kind of asocial uh, tendency that they might have. And uh, speculation would be that this might apply to women as well, but uh, I didn't find any studies that looked at women's faces. So again, that's just kind of a case where we've, you know, unconsciously picked up these correlations, I guess about people we have met and their, what we believe about their behavior and we've kind of embedded those in the way we interpret, um, interpret faces. So that reminds me of 19th century phrenology. And <laughs> I've, been reading some, I've been reading some 19th century novels lately where the author or people in the novel seem to be taking it extremely, extremely seriously in describing people um, in terms of their the shape of their face and their foreheads and so on uh, as very indicative of their character. Yeah. As it, as, as of course, these out. are all weak correlations, right? Even the thing I was telling you, they're right. statistically significant, but they're still weak correlations. Right. Um, all right, let's see. Um, all right, now someone else says, um, that uh, they recall an 85 millimeter as an ideal focal length for portraits. Well, that's different from the other person who remembered 60. Yeah, um, um, well, no, the, the, so my portrait photographer friend would agree with that if the goal is to make the person look more attractive and brighter. They, they do tend to increase the focal length to create that effect. But it doesn't necessarily make them look most like like what they actually look like. That's an important distinction. That's kind of pushing them towards an appearance that they may not actually mm -hmm. have. Right. Uh, the same person asks about any if any issues are involved with lidar. Do you know? Mm. Why? Uh, lidar is uh, distant sensing through yeah, yeah, the distance through sensing radar. Through, yes. Um, no, I mean, those things work on geometry and, uh, I, I, I wouldn't no, think so. Yeah, I don't think there's no, there's no, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, let's see. Okay. So, so someone asks, I am having problems photographing ceramic vessels with an iPhone. I get to this presentation late, so I don't know if you've already covered this. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, well, there are two problems that could occur, and the question would be which of the two it is. One is um, they can, you know, if you get up close to them, you've got a variety of distances. So we think of distances in vision science in terms of diopters. They're reciprocal distances. And if you have a, an object like a vase and you're close to it, then the difference between the farthest part you can see and the nearest part you can see is pretty significant in terms of diopters. So it's hard to get a focused image of both at the same time. The other thing with shiny ceramics is they have highlights and, um, and the highlight is actually focused in a different plane than the surface of the ceramic itself. Depending on the curvature of the ceramic, it's, it's usually focused behind the surface. It's kind of in, internal to the, to the ceramic. So it might be that he or she's having trouble with the highlights and uh, how to focus them. And that's just a problem, right? They're, they're in a different depth, so it's just, it's just a problem. Okay. <clears throat> um. All right, so this is back to the uh, different 
perceptions of the focal lengths of people, uh, so I'll notice that the happy and sad characteristics of the different focal length portraits did not vary as extremely as the other characteristics. Yeah. Happy, sad. You know, that's right. Yeah, that's Would true. Did anyone talk about that? Um, don't have an explanation for that. Um, and I don't remember Perona highlighting that in the in his paper. Mm -hmm. You know, so it would be a lot of work, but what would be really interesting to do would be to go through real faces um, that vary in dimensions and uh, give these people personality tests that would allow you to rank them on things like happiness versus sadness and honesty versus dishonesty and uh, see just how similar to those correlations these data really are. Mm -hmm. I picked on that one dimension, uh, you know, face width versus face height predicts aggressive behavior in males. Let's see, you know, we have a question about the perceiver's age. Um, what happens if you uh, look at the perceiver's age to see how they correct for the angle? Is, are, has anybody seen any difference in? We uh, don't know. The study we did um, where we asked people to vary their viewing distance was all with um, you know, Berkeley students. So they're all 18 to 25 years old. Um, there would be a reason that older people uh, might be kind of shrunk in their in their distances they would accept, and that's because they have presbyopia and inability to focus the eye to different distances, so they wouldn't get too close because they couldn't focus the image if it was close, and they wouldn't get too far depending on their correction that they wear because they may not be able to focus that either. So I'd expect the the range to shrink particularly on the near side with uh, older people. But we, we, we didn't measure that. Um, well, here's another one. Well, this is one to follow up to what you said about the uh, aggressive male faces. Uh, are booking photos taken at a focal lens to make the arrested look more aggressive or violent? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is noticeable that whenever you see a booking photo, <laughs> that people look extremely dangerous. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, but uh, you, you wonder how they set those um, pictures up. That, that's, a, that's an interesting point. Uh, uh, if, yeah. So if my photography friend in uh, Oakland was taking those shots, she knows how to make someone look uh, mm -hmm. um, more criminal-like. All right. Um, oh, here's a question about the, um, would someone very young have less experience with correction ability uh, in the brain? Uh, Do we, we do don't that? know the answer to that. Uh, and I think by very young, you'd have to go into infancy mm -hmm. because by the time kids are like four or five years old, they've had a huge amount of experience with pictures and books, uh, computer screens, televisions, et cetera. So they've had, you know, thousands of hours of experience. Uh, so that'd be a really interesting question to people have looked this phenomenon of shape constancy, that is being able to see the true shape of an object when seen at a slant. Uh, people have looked at that in uh, young infants and they don't appear to have that ability. I can't remember the exact age, but I, it, and I think in the first half year of the of life, they appear not to have that ability, and then they, they learn it. Okay. Uh, so I think I've done most of these. Did, um, there was one of our members who sent in uh, a link for uh, a video clip of six different photographers taking portraits of the same man, but the photographers are given different background on the man as, as to whether he's a former convict oh, really? or CEO. Oh, please please send that. How the photographers came up with very different portraits of the same man. So there's a there's a YouTube URL in the in the chat. Oh, that's awesome! Thank you. Okay, so, so John, I, let's uh, open it up if there was anyone yeah, who could use the chat. I was Thank just you. about to do that. 
Yes, uh, we've got to the end of the written question. So if there's anyone who wants to make an oral uh, question, uh, unmute yourself and speak up, I guess. Uh, if not, uh, then I would like to extend my thanks to, uh, on behalf of all of us to uh, Marty for this very uh, fascinating lecture. Um, well, let's see, wait a minute. Uh, someone says I didn't address their question. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> um, well, all right. Um, how does one capture sparkling dews or objects on grass or other objects? Well, don't. That, that's an interesting problem. Um, um, the, the, the simplest stuff is what we call Lambertian surfaces, basically a matte surface. Those are easy to take pictures of because they, they uh, diffuse light in all directions. They don't have funny highlights and mirror-like properties and things. But when you're trying to take pictures of uh, metallic paint or uh, glistening water on grass, uh, that creates a variety of optical phenomena that, that um, can cause the best focused image to be at different places than the object itself. Um, and so that, that's just an interesting problem of, you know, how you, depends on what effect you want to get. Uh, one of one person recommends that a polarizing filter helps with some of those types of highlights. Right? Yeah, so that's true. That's true. Okay, now I think we have reached the end. So uh, I will uh, thank Marty on behalf of all of us for a very fascinating talk. Uh, and I remind uh, those of you who are still here that uh, Emily Cooper, who was mentioned as one of the researchers here, is going to be speaking to us in December. Um, and if I could persuade her husband to <laughs> speak to it, uh, he, he had agreed in the spring, but has never agreed to do the, do the Zoom he's, version. Uh, he's well worth it. He's, uh, he does fascinating research. Right. And, um, and uh, research is important to the public because he... Right. I, I don't think he's kind of, he was doing something related to COVID. Uh, so I think he's doing something yeah. very great right now. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, Thanks. See, all you uh, see you all next uh, lecture, September 8th, hopefully. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay.